The Johannin comma, Latin, comma Johannium, is an interpolated phrase in the first epistle of John chapter 5 verses 7 to 8. It became a touchpoint for Protestant and Roman Catholic debates over the doctrine of the Trinity in the early modern period. The passage first appeared as an addition to the Vulgate, the Latin translation of the Bible, and entered the Greek manuscript tradition in the 15th century. It does not appear in the oldest Latin manuscripts, and appears to have originated as a gloss around the end of the 4th century. Some scribes gradually incorporated this annotation into the main text over the course of the Middle Ages. The first Greek manuscript of the New Testament that contains the comma dates from the 15th century. The comma is absent from the Ethiopic, Aramaic, Syriac, Slavic, Armenian, Georgian, and Arabic translations of the Greek New Testament. It appears in some English translations of the Bible via its inclusion in the first printed edition of the New Testament, Erasmus's Noum Instrumentum Omne, who added it to his text in 1522. <laughs> text Erasmus first added the Greek version of the text to his Noum Instrumentum Omne in 1522, the first two editions lack the phrase. Many subsequent early printed editions of the Bible include it, including the Coverdale Bible 1535 and the King James Bible revised from it 1611, the Geneva Bible 1560, and the douay rheims Bible 1610. It was not always included in the first printed Latin editions of the Bible, but the editors of the Sixto Clementine Vulgate 1592 chose to print it along with a number of other spurious passages. The text in italics reads, 7 For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. 8 And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. 7 Quonium tres sunt, qui testimonium dant in calo, pater, verbum, et spiritus sanctus, et high tres unum sunt. 8 Et tres sunt, qui testimonium dant in terra, spiritus, et aqua, et sanguis, et high tres unum sunt. 7 O T tres eisen oi martyrantes en to orano omicron pater omicron logos chi to agian numa chi autoi oi tres en eisen eight chi tres eisen oi martyrantes en te gi to numa chi to edor chi to ama chi oi tres eis to en eisen. There are several variant versions of the Latin and Greek texts, reflecting their later edition. After the extent of the comma's absence from biblical manuscripts became known, translations made after the 18th century omitted the phrase. English translations based on a modern critical text have omitted it since the English Revised Version, 1881, including the New International Version, NIV, New American Standard Bible, NASB, English Standard Version, ESV, and New Revised Standard Version. In the Roman Catholic tradition, the official Nova Vulgata 1979 omits the comma, as does the New American Bible 1970. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Origin. Several early sources which one might expect to include the comma Johannium in fact omit it. For example, although Clement of Alexandria c. 200 places a strong emphasis on the Trinity, his quotation of 1 John 5 verse 8 does not include the comma. Tertullian, in his Against Praxias c. 210, supports a Trinitarian view by quoting John 10 verse 30. Jerome's writings of the 4th century give no evidence that he was aware of the comma's existence. The Codex Fuldensis, a copy of the Vulgate made around 546, contains a copy of Jerome's prologue to the canonical Gospels which seems to reference the comma, but the Codex's version of 1 John omits it, which has led many to believe that the prologue's reference is spurious. The earliest reference to what might be the comma appears by the 3rd century church father Cyprian, died 258, who in Treatise I, section 6, quoted John chapter. 10 verse 30 against heretics who denied the Trinity and added, Again it is written of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Daniel B. Wallace notes that although Cyprian uses 1 John to argue for the Trinity, he appeals to this as an allusion via the three witnesses, written of, rather than by quoting a proof text, written that. In noting this, Wallace is following the current standard critical editions of the New Testament NA27 and UBS4, which consider Cyprian a witness against the comma. They would not do this were they to think him to have quoted it. 
So even though some still think that Cyprian referred to the passage, the fact that other theologians such as Athanasius of Alexandria and Sibelius and Origen never quoted or referred to that passage is one reason why even many Trinitarians later on also considered the text spurious, and not to have been part of the original text. The first work to quote the Kama Johannium as an actual part of the Epistles text appears to be the 4th century Latin homily Liber Apologeticus, probably written by Priscillian of Avila died 385, or his close follower Bishop Instantius. This part of the homily apparently then became worked into copies of the Latin Vulgate roughly around the year 800. It was subsequently back translated into the Greek, but only eight of the thousands of Greek New Testament manuscripts currently extant contain it. The oldest known occurrence appears to be a later addition to a 10th century manuscript now in the Bodleian Library, the exact date of the edition not known. In this manuscript, the comma is a variant reading offered as an alternative to the main text. The other seven sources date to the 16th century or later, and four of the seven are handwritten in the manuscript margins. In one manuscript, back translated into Greek from the Vulgate, the phrase, and these three are one is not present, no Syriac manuscripts include the comma, and its presence in some printed Syriac Bibles is due to back translation from the Latin Vulgate. Coptic manuscripts and those from Ethiopian churches also do not include it. Of the surviving, Atala, or Old Latin, translations, only two support the Textus Receptus reading, namely the Codex Monocensis 6th or 7th century and the Speculum, an 8th or 9th century collection of New Testament quotations. In the 6th century, Fulgentius of Ruspi is quoted as a witness in favor of the comma. Like Cyprian a father of the North African Church, he referred to Cyprian's remark in his Responsio contra Arianos Reply against the Arians as do many other African fathers the Arian heresy, which denied the Trinity, was particularly strong in North Africa, but the most notable and prolific writer of the African Church, Augustine of Hippo, is completely silent on the matter. Topic manuscripts The comma is not in the two oldest Vulgate manuscripts, Codex Fuldensis and the Codex Amiatinus, although it is referenced in the prologue of Fuldensis. Overall, it is estimated that over 95% of the thousands of Vulgate manuscripts contain the verse. The Vulgate text of the Epistles of John was developed from Vetus Latina manuscripts, revised by an unknown scholar to conform better with the Greek. The earliest extant Latin manuscripts supporting the comma are dated from the 5th to 7th century. The Freisinger Fragment and the Codex Legionensis 7th century, besides the younger Codex Speculum, New Testament quotations extant in an 8th or 9th century manuscript, the comma does not appear in the older Greek manuscripts. Nestle Allen is aware of eight Greek manuscripts that contain the comma. The date of the edition is late, probably dating to the time of Erasmus. In one manuscript, back translated into Greek from the Vulgate, the phrase and these three are one is not present. Both Novum Testamentum Greece NA27 and the United Bible Societies UBS4 provide three variants. The numbers here follow UBS4, which rates its preference for the first variant as a, meaning virtually certain to reflect the original text. The second variant is a longer Greek version found in only four manuscripts, the margins of three others and in some minority variant readings of lectionaries. All of the hundreds of other Greek manuscripts that contain 1 John support the first variant. The third variant is found only in Latin, in one class of Vulgate manuscripts and three patristic works. The other two Vulgate traditions omit the phrase, as do more than a dozen major church fathers who quote the verses. The Latin variant is considered a Trinitarian gloss, explaining or paralleled by the second Greek variant. The comma in Greek. All non-lectionary evidence cited, Minuscules Codex Montfortianus Minuscules 61 Gregory Allen, c. 1520, 629 Codex Autobonianus, 14th, 15th century, 918 16th century, 2318 18th century. The comma at the margins of Greek at the margins of Minuscules 88 Codex Regis, 11th century with margins added at the 16th century, 221 10th century with margins added at the 15th, 16th century, 429 14th century with margins added at the 16th century, 636 16th century, some minority variant readings in lectionaries. 
The comma in Latin, testimonium dicunt or dant in terra, spiritus or, spiritus et aqua et sanguis, et high trace unum sunt in Christo Iesu, et et trace sunt, qui testimonium dicunt in calo, pater verbum et spiritus. Giving evidence on earth, spirit, water and blood, and these three are one in Christ Jesus, eight and the three, which give evidence in heaven, are Father Word and Spirit, all evidence from fathers cited, Clementine edition of Vulgate translation, Pseudo-Augustine's Speculum Peccatoris v, also these three with some variation Cyprian, P. Cyprian, and Priscillian died 385 Liber Apologeticus and Contra Veramatum, and Pis Vigilius, Fulgentius of Ruspi died 527 Responsio Contra Arianos, Cassiodorus Complexiones in Ioannis Epist, Ad Parthos. The gradual appearance of the comma in the manuscript evidence is represented in the following tables. The comma in patristic writers Clement of Alexandria The comma is absent from an extant fragment of Clement of Alexandria c. 200, through Cassiodorus 6th century, with homily-style verse references from 1 John, including verse 1 John 5 verse 6 and 1 John 5 verse 8 without verse 7, the heavenly witnesses. He says, This is he who came by water and blood. And again, for there are three that bear witness, the Spirit, which is life, and the water, which is regeneration and faith, and the blood, which is knowledge. And these three are one. For in the Saviour are those saving virtues, and life itself exists in his own Son. Another reference that is studied is from Clement's prophetic extracts. Every promise is valid before two or three witnesses, before the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, before whom, as witnesses and helpers, what are called the commandments ought to be kept. This is seen by some as illusion evidence that Clement was familiar with the verse. <laughs> Tertullian Tertullian, in Against Praxias c. 210, supports a Trinitarian view by quoting John 10 verse 30, So the close series of the Father in the Son and the Son in the Paraclete makes three who cohere, the one attached to the other, and these three are one substance, not one person, qui trace unum sunt, non unis in the sense in which it was said, I and the Father are one, in respect of unity of substance, not of singularity of number. Tertullian's use of trace unum sunt has been seen by many commentators as supporting authenticity, a textual connection to 1 John 5 verse 7. It appears to me very clear that Tertullian is quoting I John v. 7, in the passage now under consideration. While many other commentators have argued against any comma evidence here, most emphatically John K's. Far from containing an allusion to 1 Jo, v. 7, it furnishes most decisive proof that he knew nothing of the verse. Proponents of authenticity emphasize the corroborative nature of examining the evidences of the time as one unit, including the Cyprian quotes and the Old Latin MSS. The testimony of these early fathers must stand and fall together, as Saint Cyprian obviously follows his master Tertullian. Daniel McCarthy, also referencing the views of Wettstein and Nicholas Wiseman, offers an exegesis that the three heavenly witnesses are implied by context. Georg Strecker comments cautiously, "...an initial echo of the comma Johannium occurs as early as Tertullian ADV. Pax, 25.1 CCHR 2.1195, written ca. 215. In his commentary on John chapter 16 verse 14 he writes that the Father, Son, and Paraclete are one unum, but not one person unis. However, this passage cannot be regarded as a certain attestation of the comma Johannium. References from Tertullian in De Pudicitia 21.16 on modesty the Church, in the peculiar and the most excellent sense, is the Holy Ghost, in which the three are one, and therefore the whole union of those who agree in this belief viz., that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are one, is named the Church, after its founder and sanctifier the Holy Ghost. And de baptismo Now if every word of God is to be established by three witnesses, for where there are the three, namely the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, there is the Church which is a body of the three, have also been presented as verse allusions. 
Topic: <laughs> Treatise on Rebaptism. The treatise on rebaptism, placed as a 3rd century writing and transmitted with Cyprian's works, has two sections that directly refer to the earthly witnesses, and thus has been used against authenticity by Nathaniel Lardner, Alfred Plummer and others. However, because of the context being water baptism and the precise wording being, et isti trace unum sunt, the Matthew Henry commentary uses this as evidence for Cyprian speaking of the heavenly witnesses in unity of the Church and Arthur Cleveland Cox and Nathaniel Cornwall consider the evidence as suggestively positive. Westcott and Hort also are positive. After approaching the Tertullian and Cyprian references negatively, "...morally certain that they would have quoted these words had they known them." Westcott writes about the Rebaptism Treatise, The evidence of Sent. 3 is not exclusively negative, for the treatise on Rebaptism contemporary with CYP, quotes the whole passage simply thus 15, cf. 19. Quia trace testimonium perhibent, spiritus et aqua et sanguis, et isti trace unum sunt. <inaudible> Jerome The Catholic Encyclopedia of 1910 asserts that Jerome does not seem to know the text. <inaudible> Marcus Celadensis Coming down to us with the writings of Jerome we have the statement of faith attributed to Marcus Celadensis, friend and correspondent to Jerome, presented to Cyril. To us there is one Father, and his only Son, who is very or true God, and one Holy Spirit, who is very God, and these three are one, one divinity, and power, and kingdom. And they are three persons, not two nor one. Phoebadius of Aegean Similarly, Jerome wrote of Phoebadius of Aegean in his Lives of Illustrious Men. Phoebadius, Bishop of Aegean, in Gaul, published a book against the Arians. There are said to be other works by him, which I have not yet read. He is still living, infirm with age. William Hales looks at Phoebadius. Phoebadius, A.D. 359, in his Controversy with the Arians, Cap. XIV, writes, The Lord says, I will ask of my Father, and he will give you another advocate. John XIV, 16. Thus, the Spirit is another from the Son as the Son is another from the Father, so, the third person is in the Spirit, as the second, is in the Son. All, however, are one God, because the three are one, trace unum sunt, here, 1 John V. 7, is evidently connected, as a scriptural argument, with John XIV, 16. Griesbach argued that Phoebadius was only making an allusion to Tertullian, and his unusual explanation was commented on by Reithmeyer. <laughs> Augustine Augustine of Hippo has been said to be completely silent on the matter, which has been taken as evidence that the comma did not exist as part of the epistle's text in his time. This argumentum ex silentio has been contested by other scholars, including Fickerman and Metzger. In addition, some Augustine references have been seen as verse allusions. The City of God section, from Book V, Chapter 11. Therefore God supreme and true, with his word and Holy Spirit, which three are one, one God omnipotent, has often been referenced as based upon the scripture verse of the heavenly witnesses. George Strecker acknowledges the City of God reference, except for a brief remark in De Civitate Dei 5.11, CCHR 47.141, where he says of Father, Word, and Spirit that the three are one. Augustine 430 does not cite the comma Johannium. But it is certain on the basis of the work Contra Maximum 2.22.3 place 42.794 to 95 that he interpreted 1 John chapter 5 verses 7 to 8 in trinitarian terms. Similarly, homily 10 on the first epistle of John has been asserted as an allusion to the verse. And what meaneth Christ is the end? Because Christ is God and the end of the commandment is charity and charity is God, because Father and Son and Holy Ghost are one. Contra Maximinum has received attention especially for these two sections, especially the allegorical interpretation. 
I would not have thee mistake that place in the Epistle of John the Apostle where he saith, There are three witnesses, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and the three are one. Lest haply thou say that the Spirit and the water and the blood are diverse substances, and yet it is said, The three are one. For this cause I have admonished thee, that thou mistake not the matter. For these are mystical expressions, in which the point always to be considered is, not what the actual things are, but what they denote as signs, since they are signs of things, and what they are in their essence is one thing, what they are in their signification another. If then we understand the things signified, we do find these things to be of one substance, but if we will inquire into the things signified by these, there not unreasonably comes into our thoughts the Trinity itself, which is the one, only, true, supreme God, Father and Son and Holy Ghost, of whom it could most truly be said, There are three witnesses, and the three are one. There has been an ongoing dialogue about context and sense. John Scott Porter writes, Augustine, in his book Against Maximin the Arian, turns every stone to find arguments from the scriptures to prove that though Spirit is God, and that the three persons are the same in substance, but does not adduce this text, nay, clearly shows that he knew nothing of it, for he repeatedly employs the eighth verse, and says, that by the Spirit, the blood, and the water, the persons of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, arc signified ccontr. Maxim, cap. xxii. Thomas Joseph Lamy offers a different view based on the context and Augustine's purpose. Similarly Thomas Burgess. And Norbert Fickerman's reference and scholarship supports the idea that Augustine may have deliberately bypassed a direct quote of the heavenly witnesses. <laughs> Leo the Great in the Tome of Leo, written to Archbishop Flavian of Constantinople, read at the Council of Chalcedon on 10 October 451 AD, and published in Greek, Leo the Great's usage of 1 John chapter 5 has him moving in discourse from verse 6 to verse 8. This is the victory which overcometh the world, even our faith. And who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are one, that is, the Spirit of sanctification, and the blood of redemption, and the water of baptism, which three things are one, and remain undivided. This epistle from Leo was considered by Richard Porson to be the strongest proof of verse inauthenticity. The strongest proof that this verse is spurious may be drawn from the epistle of Leo the Great to Flavianus upon the Incarnation, and went along with Porson's assertion that the verse was slow to enter into the Latin lines. Porson asserted that the verse remained a rude, unformed mass, and was not completely licked into shape till the end of the 10th century. In response, Thomas Burgess points out that the context of Leo's argument would not call for the 7th verse and that the verse was referenced in a fully formed manner centuries earlier than Porson's claim, at the time of Fulgentius and the Council of Carthage. Burgess pointed out that there were multiple confirmations that the verse was in the Latin Bibles of Leo's day. Burgess argued, ironically, that the fact that Leo could move from verse 6 to 8 for argument context is, in the bigger picture, favorable to authenticity. Leo's omission of the verse is not only counterbalanced by its actual existence in contemporary copies, but the passage of his letter is, in some material respects, favorable to the authenticity of the verse, by its contradiction to some assertions confidently urged against the verse by its opponents, and essential to their theory against it. Today, with the discovery of additional Old Latin evidences in the 19th century, the discourse of Leo is rarely referenced as a significant evidence against verse authenticity. Topic: <inaudible> Cyprian of Carthage. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Unity of the Church. The 3rd century church father Cyprian c. 200-58, in writing on the unity of the church, treatise I section 6 quoted John chapter 10 verse 30 and another scriptural spot. The Catholic Encyclopedia concludes, Cyprian, seems undoubtedly to have had it in mind. Against this view, Daniel B. Wallace writes that since Cyprian does not quote the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, this in the least does not afford proof that he knew of such wording. 
and the fact that Cyprian did not quote the exact wording, indicates that a Trinitarian interpretation was superimposed on the text by Cyprian. In his position against Cyprian knowing of the comma, Wallace is in agreement with the earlier critical edition of the New Testament NA 26 and UBS 3 which considered Cyprian a witness against the comma, the Cyprian citation, dating to more than a century before any extant epistle of John manuscripts and before the Arian controversies that are often considered pivotal in verse edition, omission debate, remains a central focus of comma research and textual apologetics. The Scrivener view is often discussed. Westcott and Hort assert, "...Turt and CYP use language which renders it morally certain that they would have quoted these words had they known them, CYP going so far as to assume a reference to the Trinity in the conclusion of v. 8 inches." In the 20th century, Lutheran scholar Francis Pieper wrote in Christian Dogmatics emphasizing the antiquity and significance of the reference. Frequently commentators have seen Cyprian as having the verse in his Latin Bible, even if not directly supporting and commenting on verse authenticity. And some writers have seen the denial of the verse in the Bible of Cyprian as worthy of special note and humor. <laughs> Ad Jubayanum Epistle 73 The second, lesser reference from Cyprian that has been involved in the verse debate is from Ad Jubayanum 23.12. Cyprian, while discussing baptism, writes, If he obtained the remission of sins, he was sanctified, and if he was sanctified, he was made the temple of God. But of what God? I ask. The Creator? Impossible, he did not believe in him. Christ? But he could not be made Christ's temple, for he denied the deity of Christ. The Holy Spirit? Since the three are one, what pleasure could the Holy Spirit take in the enemy of the Father and the Son? Niddle emphasizes that Cyprian would be familiar with the Bible in Greek as well as Latin. Cyprian understood Greek. He read Homer, Plato, Hermes Trismegiatus and Hippocrates. He translated into Latin the Greek epistle written to him by Fermilianus. UBS 4 has its entry for text inclusion as Cyprian. P. Cyprian The hundredfold reward for martyrs and ascetics, decentesima, sexagesimal tricesima speaks of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit as three witnesses, and was passed down with the Cyprian corpus. This was only first published in 1914 and thus does not show up in the historical debate. UBS 4 includes this in the apparatus as P. Cyprian. Origin and Athanasius Those who see Cyprian as negative evidence assert that other church writers, such as Athanasius of Alexandria and Origen, never quoted or referred to the passage, which they would have done if the verse was in the Bibles of that era. The contrasting position is that there are in fact such references, and that "...evidences from silence." Arguments, looking at the extant early church writer material, should not be given much weight as reflecting absence in the manuscripts, with the exception of verse-by-verse -verse homilies, which were uncommon in the anti-Nicene era. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Origins Scholium on Psalm chapter 123, verse 2. In the Scholium on Psalm chapter 123, attributed to Origen, is the commentary. This has been considered by many commentators, including the translation source Nathaniel Ellsworth Cornwall, as an allusion to verse 7. Ellsworth especially noted the Richard Porson comment in response to the evidence of the Psalm commentary. The critical chemistry which could extract the doctrine of the Trinity from this place must have been exquisitely refining. Fabricius wrote about the origin wording, Ad locum 1 Jo v. 7 alludi ab origin non est dubitandum. Athanasius and Arius at the Council of Nicaea Traditionally, Athanasius was considered to lend support to the authenticity of the verse, one reason being the disputation with Arius at the Council of Nicaea which circulated with the works of Athanasius, where is found Likewise is not the remission of sins procured by that quickening and sanctifying ablution, without which no man shall see the kingdom of heaven, an ablution given to the faithful in the thrice-blessed name. 
and besides all these, John says, and the three are one. Today, many scholars consider this a later work pseudo-Athanasius, perhaps by Maximus the Confessor. Charles Forster in New Plea argues for the writing as stylistically Athanasius. While the author and date are debated, this is a Greek reference directly related to the doctrinal Trinitarian Arian controversies, and one that purports to be an account of Nicaea when those doctrinal battles were raging. The reference was given in UBS 3 as supporting verse inclusion, yet was removed from UBS 4 for reasons unknown. The synopsis of scripture, often ascribed to Athanasius, has also been referenced as indicating awareness of the comma. Topic. Priscillian of Avila The earliest quotation which some scholars consider a direct reference to the heavenly witnesses from the first epistle of John is from the Spaniard Priscillian c. 380. As the Latin is presented by a secondary source, it reads, Tria sunt quae testimonium dicunt in terra aqua caro et sanguis et haec tria in unum sunt, et tria sunt quae testimonium dissent in calo pater urbum et spiritus et haets tria unum sunt in Christo iesu. The secondary source for the Latin includes only one comma of punctuation apparently unspecified as in the original or inserted by the modern editor. And this Latin has no indication as to where the quotation of 1 John ends in Priscillian nor where Priscillian starts making comments on it if he does. As given rendered in English, the statement reads, As John says and there are three which give testimony on earth the water the flesh the blood and these three are in one and there are three which give testimony in heaven the Father the Word and the Spirit and these three are one in Christ Jesus capital speculative, punctuation deleted from English translation is probably little or no punctuation in original. Theodor Zahn calls this, "...the earliest quotation of the passage which is certain and which can be definitely dated circa 380." A view expressed by Westcott, Brooke, Metzger and others, and Georg Strecker adds context. The oldest undoubted instance is in Priscillian Liber Apologeticus I.4 Priscillian was probably a Sibelianist or modalist, whose principal interest would have in the closing statement about the heavenly witnesses. And these three, the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit, are one. Quote closing parenthesis dot. Here he found his theological opinions confirmed, that the three persons of the Trinity are only modes or manners of appearance of the one God. This observation caused some interpreters to suppose that Priscillian himself created the Comma Johannium. However, there are signs of the Comma Johannium, although no certain attestations, even before Priscillian. In the early 1900s the Karl Kunstel theory of Priscillian origination and interpolation was popular. The verse is an interpolation, first quoted and perhaps introduced by Priscillian a. D. 380, as a pious fraud to convince doubters of the doctrine of the Trinity. <laughs> <laughs> Expositio Fidei Another complementary early reference is an exposition of faith published in 1883 by Karl Paul Caspery from the Ambrosian manuscript, which also contains the Muratorian canon fragment Pater est in genitus, filius uero sine initio genitus a patra est, spiritus autum sanctus processit a patra et accipit de filio, sicut euangelista testator quia scriptum est. Trace sunt qui dicunt testimonium in calo pater urbum et spiritus. Et haec tria unum sunt in Christo lesu. Non tamen dixit. Unis est in Christo lesu. Edgar Simmons Buchanan, points out that the reading, in Christo iesu, is textually valuable, referencing 1 John 5 verse 7. The authorship is uncertain, however it is often placed around the same period as Priscillian. Carl Kunstel saw the writing as anti-Priscillianist, which would have competing doctrinal positions utilizing the verse. Alan England Brook notes the similarities of the expositio with the Priscillian form, and the Priscillian form with the Leon Palimpsest. Theodor Zahn refers to the expositio as possibly contemporaneous to Priscillian. Apparently taken from the proselyte Isaac alias Ambrosiaster. John Chapman looked closely at these materials in the section in Liber Apologeticus around the Priscillian faith statement. 
Pater Deus, Filius, Deus, et Spiritus Sanctus Deus, Haec Unum Sunt in Christo Iesu. Chapman saw an indication that Priscillian found himself bound to defend the comma by citing from the Unity of the Church Cyprian section. Topic: <laughs> Council of Carthage, 484. The comma was invoked at Carthage in 484 when the Catholic anti-Arian bishops of North Africa confessed their faith before Huneric the Vandal, Victor de Vida, Historia Persecutionis Africani Prov 2.82, 3.11, CSEL 760. The Confession of Faith representing the hundreds of Orthodox bishops included the following section, emphasizing the heavenly witnesses to teach Lus Clarius clearer than the light and so, no occasion for uncertainty is left. It is clear that the Holy Spirit is also God and the author of his own will, he who is most clearly shown to be at work in all things and to bestow the gifts of the divine dispensation according to the judgment of his own will, because where it is proclaimed that he distributes graces where he wills, servile condition cannot exist, for servitude is to be understood in what is created, but power and freedom in the Trinity. And so that we may teach the Holy Spirit to be of one divinity with the Father and the Son still more clearly than the light, here is proof from the testimony of John the Evangelist. For he says, There are three who bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Surely he does not say, Three separated by a difference in quality. Or, Divided by grades which differentiate, so that there is a great distance between them. No, he says that the three are one, but so that the single divinity which the Holy Spirit has with the Father and the Son might be demonstrated still more in the creation of all things. You have in the book of Job the Holy Spirit as a creator. It is the divine spirit. Topic: <laughs> De Trinitate and Contra Verumatum. There are additional heavenly witnesses references that are considered to be from the same period as the Council of Carthage, including references that have been attributed to Vigilius Tapsensis who attended the council. Raymond Brown gives one summary Less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 in the century following Priscillian, the chief appearance of the comma is in tractates defending the Trinity. In place 62 227-334 there is a work de Trinitate consisting of twelve books. In books 1 and 10 place 62, 243d, 246b, 297b the comma is cited three times. Another work on the Trinity consisting of three books Contra Verumatum, North African origin ca. 450 seems probable. The comma is cited in 1.5 CC 90, 20-21. One of the references in De Trinitate, from Book V, But the Holy Ghost abides in the Father, and in the Son filio, and in Himself, as the Evangelist St. John so absolutely testifies in his epistle, and the three are one. But how, ye heretics, are the three one, if their substance he divided or cut asunder? Or how are they one, if they be placed one before another? Or how are the three one, if the divinity be different in each? How are they one, if there reside not in them the united eternal plenitude of the Godhead? These references are in the UBS apparatus as P's Vigilius. The Contra Verumatum reference John the Evangelist, in his Epistle to the Parthians, i.e. his first epistle, says there are three who afford testimony on earth, the water, the blood, and the flesh, and these three are in us, and there are three who afford testimony in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. This is in the UBS apparatus as Verumatum. Eberd, in referencing this quote, comments, we see that he had before him the passage in his New Testament in its corrupt form aqua, sanguis et caro, et trace in nobis sunt, but also, that the gloss was already in the text, and not merely in a single copy, but that it was so widely diffused and acknowledged in the West as to be appealed to by him bona fide in his contest with his Arian opponents. <laughs> Fulgentius of Ruspi. In the 6th century, Fulgentius of Ruspi, like Cyprian a father of the North African Church, skilled in Greek as well as his native Latin, used the verse in the doctrinal battles of the day. <laughs> Contra Arianos 
from Responsio contra Arianos, reply against the Arians, Minya ad 10, cc 91a, 797. In the Father, therefore, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we acknowledge unity of substance, but dare not confound the persons. For St. John the Apostle, testifies saying, There are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. Then Fulgentius discusses the earlier reference by Cyprian, and the interweaving of the two Johannine verses, John 10 verse 30 and 1 John 5 verse 7. Which also the blessed martyr Cyprian, in his Epistle de Unitate Ecclesia Unity of the Church, confesseth, saying, Whoso breaketh the peace of Christ, and concord, acteth against Christ, whoso gathereth elsewhere beside the Church, scattereth. And that he might show, that the Church of the One God is one, he inserted these testimonies, immediately from the Scriptures, the Lord said, I and the Father are one. And again, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is written, And these three are one. Topic. Contra Fabianum Another heavenly witness's reference from Fulgentius is in Contra Fabianum Fragmenta Minia Frag. 21.4, CC 01A, 797 The Blessed Apostle, St. John evidently says, and the three are one, which was said of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as I have before shown, when you demanded of me for a reason. Topic. De Trinitate ad Felicem Also from Fulgentius in De Trinitate ad Felicem See, in short you have it that the Father is one, the Son another, and the Holy Spirit another, in person, each is other, but in nature they are not other. In this regard he says, The Father and I, we are one. He teaches us that one refers to their nature, and we are to their persons. In like manner it is said, there are three who bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. Today these references are generally accepted as probative to the verse being in the Bible of Fulgentius. <laughs> Adversus Pintum Episcopum Arianum a reference in De Fide Catholica Adversus Pintum Episcopum Arianum that is a testimonia de Trinitate. Topic. Pseudo Jerome, Prologue to the Catholic Epistles The Codex Fuldensis includes a prologue to the Catholic Epistles referring to the comma beginning with the words non ida ordo esta put Grecos. It presents itself as a letter of Jerome to Eustachium, but as the work of an unknown imitator, likely from the late 5th century. Its inauthenticity is stressed by the omission of the passage from the manuscript's own text of 1 John, but it demonstrates that some theologians of the 5th century felt it should be included. Cassiodorus Cassiodorus wrote Bible commentaries, and was familiar with Old Latin and Vulgate manuscripts, seeking out sacred manuscripts. Cassiodorus was also skilled in Greek. In Complexiones in Epistolis Apostolorum, first published in 1721 by Scipio Maffei, in the commentary section on 1 John, from the Cassiodorus Corpus, is written Thomas Joseph Lamy describes the Cassiodorus section and references that Tischendorf saw this as Cassiodorus having the text in his Bible. However, earlier, Porson endeavored to show that Cassiodorus had, in his copy, no more than the eighth verse, to which he added the gloss of Eucarius, with whose writings he was acquainted. Topic. Isidore of Seville In the early 7th century, the Testimonia Divina Scriptura et Patrum is often attributed to Isidore of Seville. De Distinctions Personarum, Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. In Epistola Joannis. Quonium trace sunt qui testimonium dant in terra spiritus, aqua, et sanguis, et trace unum sunt in Christo Jesu, et trace sunt qui testimonium dicunt in silo, pater, verbum, et spiritus, et trace unum sunt. Arthur Marie Lahire asserts that evidences like Isidore and the Ambrose Ansbert commentary on Revelation show early circulation of the Vulgate with the verse and thus also should be considered in the issues of Jerome's original Vulgate text and the authenticity of the Vulgate prologue. 
Cassiodorus has also been indicated as reflecting the Vulgate text, rather than simply the Vetus Latina. Commentary on Revelation Ambrose Ansbert refers to the scripture verse in his Revelation commentary, Although the expression of faithful witness found therein, refers directly to Jesus Christ alone, yet it equally characterizes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, according to these words of St. John. There are three which bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Ambrose Ansbert, in the middle of the 8th century, wrote a comment upon the Apocalypse, in which this verse is applied, in explaining the fifth verse of the first chapter of the Revelation. Medieval use of the comma <laughs> Fourth Lateran Council In the Middle Ages a Trinitarian doctrinal debate arose around the position of Joachim of Florence 1135 which was different from the more traditional view of Peter Lombard c. 1100-1160. When the Fourth Council of the Lateran was held in 1215 at Rome, with hundreds of bishops attending, the understanding of the heavenly witnesses was a primary point in siding with Lombard, against the writing of Joachim. For, he says, Christ's faithful are not one in the sense of a single reality which is common to all. They are one only in this sense, that they form one church through the unity of the Catholic faith, and finally one kingdom through a union of indissoluble charity. Thus we read in the canonical letter of John, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father and the Word and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one, and he immediately adds, and the three that bear witness on earth are the Spirit, water and blood, and the three are one, according to some manuscripts. The council thus printed the verse in both Latin and Greek, and this may have contributed to later scholarship references in Greek to the verse. The reference to some manuscripts showed an acknowledgement of textual issues, yet this likely related to, and the three are one, in verse 8, not the heavenly witnesses in verse 7. The manuscript issue for the final phrase in verse 8 and the commentary by Thomas Aquinas were an influence upon the text and note of the Complutensian polyglot. <laughs> Latin commentaries In this period, the greater portion of Bible commentary was written in Latin. The references in this era are extensive and wide-ranging. Some of the better-known writers who utilized the comma as scripture, in addition to Peter Lombard and Joachim of Fiori, include Gerbert of Aurillac, Pope Sylvester, Peter Abillard, Bernard of Clairvaux, Dun Scotus, Roger of Wendover, historian, including the Lateran Council, Thomas Aquinas, many verse uses, including one which has origin relating to the three that give witness in heaven. William of Ockham of Razor fame, Nicholas of Lyra and the commentary of the Glossa Ordinaria. <inaudible> <inaudible> Greek commentaries Emmanuel Kalekas in the 14th and Joseph Bryennius c. 1350-1430 in the 15th century reference the comma in their Greek writings. The Orthodox accepted the comma as Johannine scripture notwithstanding its absence in the Greek manuscripts line. The Orthodox Confession of Faith, published in Greek in 1643 by the multilingual scholar Peter Mogila specifically references the comma. Accordingly the Evangelist teacheth 1 John v. 7. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost and these three are one. Armenia, Synod of Sis The Epistle of Gregory, the Bishop of Sis, to Hatho c. 1270 utilized 1 John 5 verse 7 in the context of the use of water in the Mass. The Synod of Sis of 1307 expressly cited the verse, and deepened the relationship with Rome. Commentators generally see the Armenian text from the 13th century on as having been modified by the interaction with the Latin Church and Bible, including the addition of the comma in some manuscripts. <laughs> manuscripts and special notations 
There are a number of special manuscript notations and entries relating to 1 John 5 verse 7. Vulgate scholar Samuel Berger reports on Mississippi, 13174 in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris that shows the scribe listing four distinct textual variations of the heavenly witnesses. Three are understood by the scribe to have textual lineages of Athanasius, Augustine and Fulgentius. The Franciscan Correctorium gives a note about there being manuscripts with the verses transposed. The Regensburg Mis referenced by Fickerman discusses the positions of Jerome and Augustine. The Glossa Ordinaria discusses the Vulgate prologue in the preface, in addition to its commentary section on the verse. John J. Contrini in Hamo of Auxerre, Abbot of Sachium, Les Bois, and a new sermon on 1 John v. 4 10 discusses a 9th century manuscript and the Leiden sermon. <laughs> Inclusion by Erasmus The central figure in the 16th-century history of the Johannine comma is the humanist Erasmus, and his efforts leading to the publication of the Greek New Testament. The comma was omitted in the first edition in 1516, the Noum Instrumentum Omne, Diligenter ab Erasmo Rotaridamo Recognitum et Emendatum and the second edition of 1519. The verse is placed in the third edition, published in 1522, and those of 1527 and 1535. Erasmus included the comma, with commentary, in his paraphrase edition, first published in 1520. And in Ratio Seu Methodus Compendio Peruiniendi ad Uram Theologium, first published in 1518, Erasmus included the comma in the interpretation of John chapter 12 and 13. Erasmian scholar John Jack Bateman, discussing the paraphrase and the Ratio Urae Theologia, says of these uses of the comma that Erasmus attributes some authority to it despite any doubts he had about its transmission in the Greek text. The New Testament of Erasmus provoked critical responses that focused on a number of verses, including his text and translation decisions on Romans chapter 9 verse 5, John chapter 1 verses 1, 1 Timothy 1:17, Titus chapter 2 verse 13 and Philippians chapter 2 verse 6. The absence of the comma from the first two editions received a sharp response from churchmen and scholars, and was discussed and defended by Erasmus in the correspondence with Edward Lee and Diego López de Zúñiga Stunica, and Erasmus is also known to have referenced the verse in correspondence with Antoine Brunyard in 1518. The first two Erasmus editions only had a small note about the verse. The major Erasmus writing regarding comma issues was in the Annotationes to the third edition of 1522, expanded in the fourth edition of 1527 and then given a small edition in the fifth edition of 1535. Erasmus is said to have replied to his critics that the comma did not occur in any of the Greek manuscripts he could find, but that he would add it to future editions if it appeared in a single Greek manuscript. Such a manuscript was subsequently produced, some say concocted, by a Franciscan, and Erasmus, true to his word, added the comma to his 1522 edition, but with a lengthy footnote setting out his suspicion that the manuscript had been prepared expressly to confute him. This change was accepted into editions based on the Textus Receptus, the chief source for the King James Version, thereby fixing the comma firmly in the English language scriptures for centuries. There is no explicit evidence, however, that such a promise was ever made. Topic. Modern reception In 1807 Charles Butler described the dispute to that point as consisting of three distinct phases. Topic. Erasmus and the Reformation The first phase began with the disputes and correspondence involving Erasmus with Edward Lee followed by Jacobus Stunica and about the 16th century controversies, Thomas Burgess summarized, "...in the 16th century its chief opponents were Socinus, Blandrata, and the Fraters Polani, its defenders, Lay, Beza, Bellarmine, and Sixtus Sinensis." In the 17th century John Selden in Latin and Francis Scheinel and Henry Hammond were English writers with studies on the verse, Johann Gerhard and Abraham Calovius from the German Lutherans, writing in Latin. Topic. Simon, Newton, Mill and Bengal 
The second dispute stage begins with Sandius, the Arian around 1670. Francis Turretin published De Tribus Testibus Coelestibus in 1674 and the verse was a central focus of the writings of Simon Patrick. In 1689 the attack on authenticity by Richard Simon was published in English, in his critical history of the text of the New Testament. Many responded directly to the views of Simon, including Thomas Smith, Friedrich Kettner, James Benign Boswit, Johann Magis, Thomas Idegius, Abraham Taylor and the published sermons of Edmund Calamy. There was the famous verse defenses by John Mill and later by Johann Bengel. Also in this era was the David Martin and Thomas Emlyn debate. There were attacks on authenticity by Richard Bentley and Samuel Clark and William Whiston and defense of authenticity by John Guise in The Practical Expositor. There were writings by numerous additional scholars, including publication in London of Isaac Newton's Two Letters in 1754, which he had written to John Locke in 1690. The Mariner's Compass poem of Bengal was given in a slightly modified form by John Wesley. Travis and Porson debate The third stage of the controversy begins with the quote from Edward Gibbon in 1776, Even the scriptures themselves were profaned by their rash and sacrilegious hands. The memorable text, which asserts the unity of the three who bear witness in heaven, is condemned by the universal silence of the Orthodox Fathers, ancient versions, and authentic manuscripts. It was first alleged by the Catholic bishops whom Hunneric summoned to the Conference of Carthage. An allegorical interpretation, in the form, perhaps, of a marginal note, invaded the text of the Latin Bibles, which were renewed and corrected in a dark period of ten centuries. It is followed by the response of George Travis that led to the Porson-Travis debate. In the 1794 third edition of Letters to Edward Gibbon, Travis included a 42-part appendix with source references. Another event coincided with the inauguration of this stage of the debate. A great stirring in sacred science was certainly going on. Griesbach's first edition of the New Testament marks the commencement of a new era. The Griesbach GNT provided an alternative to the received text editions to assist as scholarship textual legitimacy for opponents of the verse. Topic. 19th century Some highlights from this era are the Nicholas Wiseman Old Latin and Speculum Scholarship, the defense of the verse by the German Sander, Besser and Mayer, the Charles Forster New Plea book which revisited Richard Porson's arguments, and the earlier work by his friend Arthur Marie Lahir. Discoveries included the Priscillian Reference and Exposito Fide, also Old Latin manuscripts including La Cava, and the moving up of the date of the Vulgate Prologue due to its being found in Codex Fuldensis. Ezra Abbott wrote on 1 John 5.7 and Luther's German Bible and Scrivener's Analysis came forth in six lectures and plain introduction. In the 1881 revision came the full removal of the verse. Daniel McCarthy noted the change in position among the textual scholars, and in French there was the sharp Roman Catholic debate in the 1880s involving Pierre Rambouillet, Auguste François Manori, Jean-Michel Alfred Vacant, Elie Philippe and Paulin Martin. In Germany Wilhelm Kohling defended authenticity, and in Ireland Charles Vincent Dolman wrote about the revision and the comma in the Dublin Review, noting that, "...the heavenly witnesses have departed." <laughs> 20th century The 20th century saw the scholarship of Alan England Brooke and Joseph Pola, the RCC controversy following the 1897 papal declaration as to whether the verse could be challenged by Catholic scholars, the Karl Kunstel Priscillian origin theory, the detailed scholarship of Augustus Bluto in many papers, the Eduard Riggenbach book, and the Franz Pieper and Edward Hill's defenses. There were specialty papers by Anton Baumstark, Syriac reference, Norbert Fickerman, Augustine, Claude Jenkins, Bede, Matteo del Alamo, Teofilo Ayuso Marizuela, Franz Posset, Luther, and Reichel Borger, Peshitta. Verse dismissals, such as that given by Bruce Metzger, became popular. There was the fine technical scholarship of Raymond Brown and the continuing publication and studies of the Erasmus correspondence, writings, and annotations, some with English translation. 
From Germany came Walter Thiele's Old Latin Studies and Sympathy for the Comma Being in the Bible of Cyprian, and the research by Henk de Jong on Erasmus and the Received Text and the Comma. Recent scholarship The last twenty years have seen a popular revival of interest in the historic verse controversies and the textual debate. Factors include the growth of interest in the received text and the authorized version including the King James Version only movement and the questioning of critical text theories. The 1995 book by Michael Maynard documenting the historical debate on 1 John chapter 5 verse 7 and the internet ability to spur research and discussion with participatory interaction. In this period, King James Bible defenders and opponents wrote a number of papers on the Johannine comma, usually published in evangelical literature and on the internet. In textual criticism scholarship circles, the book by Klaus Wachel der Byzantinische Text der Katholischen Brief, Eine Untersuchung zur Entstehung der Coin des Neuen Testaments, 1995 contains a section with detailed studies on the comma. Similarly, Der Einzig war Bibeltext, published in 2006 by K. Martin Haida. Special interest has been given to the studies of the Codex Vaticanus Umlauts by Philip Barton Payne and Paul Kennard, senior paleographer at the Vatican Library. The Erasmus studies have continued, including research on the Viadolid inquiry by Peter G. Beatonholz and Lou Ann Hamza. Jan Kranz has written on conjectural emendation and other textual topics, looking closely at the received text work of Erasmus and Beza. And some elements of the recent scholarship commentary have been especially dismissive and negative. Roman Catholic Church The Roman Catholic Church at the Council of Trent in 1546 defined the biblical canon as the entire books with all their parts, as these have been wont to be read in the Catholic Church and are contained in the Old Latin Vulgate. On the Catholic side, the comma appeared in both the 16 and the Clementine editions of the Vulgate, the latter of which became the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church. Although the revised Vulgate contained the comma, the earliest known copies did not, leaving the status of the comma Johannium unclear. On 13 January 1897, during a period of reaction in the Church, the Holy Office decreed that Catholic theologians could not, with safety, deny or call into doubt the comma's authenticity. Pope Leo XIII approved this decision two days later, though his approval was not in forma specifica. That is, Leo XIII did not invest his full papal authority in the matter, leaving the decree with the ordinary authority possessed by the Holy Office. Three decades later, on 2 June 1927, Pope Pius XI decreed that the Comma Johannium was open to dispute. <laughs> King James only movement In more recent years, the comma has become relevant to the King James-only movement, a largely Protestant development most prevalent within the fundamentalist and independent Baptist branch of the Baptist churches. Many proponents view the comma as an important Trinitarian text. The defense of the verse by Edward Freer Hills in 1956 as part of his defense of the Textus Receptus the King James Version defended the Johannine comma 1 John 5 verse 7 was unusual due to Hills' textual criticism scholarship credentials. Grammatical <laughs> <laughs> analysis <laughs> 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 In 1 John chapter 5 verses 7 to 8 in the received text the following words appear the words in bold print are the words of the Johannine comma received text 1 John chapter 5 verse 7 hoi martyrantes en toi urinoi ho pater ho logos kai to hagian numa 8 hoi martyrantes en te ge to numa kai to hydor kai to hema 5 to 7 the ones bearing witness in the heaven the father the word and the holy spirit 8 the ones bearing witness on the earth the spirit and the water and the blood in 1 john chapter 5 verses 7 to 8 in the critical text and majority text the following words appear Critical text and majority text 1 John chapter 5 verse 7 hoi martyrantes 8 to numa kai to hydor kai to hema 5 to 7 the ones bearing witness 8 the spirit and the water and the blood 
According to Johann Bengel, Eugenius Bulgaris, John Oxley, and Daniel Wallace, each article participle phrase hoi martyrantes in 1 John chapter 5 verses 7 to 8 functions as a substantive and agrees with the natural gender masculine of the idea being expressed persons, to which three subsequent appositional added for clarification articular preceded by an article nouns, ho pater ho logos kai to hagian numa to numa kai to hydor kai to hema are added. According to Frederick Nolan, Robert Dabney and Edward Hills, each article participle phrase hoi martyrantes in 1 John 5 verses 7–8 functions as an adjective that modifies the three subsequent articular nouns, ho pater ho logos kai ta hagian numa ta numa kai ta hydor kai ta hema and therefore must agree with the grammatical gender masculine, neuter of the first subsequent articular noun, Ho pater tenuma. Titus chapter 2 verse 13 is an example of how an article adjective or article participle phrase looks when it functions as an adjective that modifies multiple subsequent nouns. Received text. Titus chapter 2 verse 13. 10 Macarian Elpida Chi Epiphanian 2:13. The blessed hope and appearance. Matthew chapter 23 verse 23 is an example of how an article adjective or article participle phrase looks when it functions as a substantive to which multiple subsequent appositional articular nouns are added. Received text Matthew chapter 23 verse 23 Ta baratera tu nomu ten chrisen kai tun elian kai ten piston twenty three twenty three the things weightier of the law the judgment and the mercy and the faith. According to Bengal, Bulgaris, Oxley and Wallace, 1 John chapter 5 verses 7 to 8 is like Matthew chapter 23 verse 23, not like Titus chapter 2 verse 13. According to Nolan, Dabney and Hills, 1 John chapter 5 verses 7 to 8 is like Titus chapter 2 verse 13, not like Matthew chapter 23 verse 23. Topic: See also Textual criticism David Martin French divine, the French Bible translator who also defended the authenticity of the Kama Johannium. Codex Ravianus Other disputed New Testament passages The longer ending of Mark Pericope adulterae Matthew 16 verse 2b3 Christ's agony at Gethsemane John chapter 5 verse 3 b4 Doxology to the Lord's Prayer Luke chapter 22 verse 19 b20